Okay, so where did we leave off last time? We left off really at the Siege of Londonderry and this talk will take up mostly the Siege of Londonderry. A little bit about Scotland at the end, but really the Siege of Londonderry is what it's all about. Okay, so we left off with Lundy indecisive about what he was going to do. And he basically, the, the council have made the decision with him that they are going to send away the relief force. The reason being they thought that they didn't have enough food to keep the, the, the two regiments that William had sent to relieve the city. So there was delegations sent and everything else, but it, as, I, as we know, they were sent away um, and the people were very annoyed at this. It also proved again Lundy's reluctance to the defence of the city. Uh, and again, this goes in the whole thing of, of, of Judas Lundy. Lundy wanted to quit the city. He um, basically didn't want the siege. He'd seen sieges before in his military career and he didn't want any more sieges. So on the 15th of April, um, Colonel Richards, a local townsman, attack, uh, he tackled Walker. Uh, sorry, Lundy. He, tack he tackled Lundy and said to Lundy, why do you want to qu quit the city? Quitting the city is like quitting the kingdom. But Lundy had nothing to say to him. Adam Murray, who is going to really play a big role in this, this whole talk. Adam Murray, um, who was from Ling, which is just outside the city of Londonderry, um, in a small farmstead he came from, uh, was a Culmore. Culmore is outside the city, about three miles outside the city. Um, and he was hearing about this dithering, about what they were going to do. Are they going to surrender? Well, he wouldn't accept the surrender at all. Uh, and so Murray then retreats his troop of horse back towards the city and, and stops at Pennyburn Mill. Uh, then Lundy sees the Jacobites on the other side of the river uh, and he's starting negotiations with the Jacobites. So he doesn't want Murray getting involved. He doesn't want Murray's men to be seen to cause any trouble between the Jacobites and, and the garrison forces. So Murray basically, um, he has to do what he's told, but he doesn't. Murray is completely annoyed. He hears this, these people come from the city, tell them to retreat behind the hill, the windmill hill. And he's just like, no, I'm not going anywhere. I'm staying here. But eventually then he hears about this, this surrender package that's being drawn up and he's not happy. So Murray then goes back to the city and starts to get the people riled up and saying, how dare this man Lundy, how dare he surrender this city? It's not up for him to surrender the city. Do you want to fight? And he got people involved and he says, get white handkerchiefs and tie them to your left elbow. And this will show the defiance against Lundy and against the council. Uh, and also defiance against James and, and his invading force. So Lundy uh, doesn't know what to do. Lundy's stuck between a rock and a hard place. Um, and he really wants to get the city surrendered and, and get himself out of this whole situation. Because Lundy was commissioned by James, we talked about it last week. So... Uh, Walker then asks for a council meeting to be held and Murray comes along to this council meeting and Murray along with um, a couple of other officers they basically push the issue that if Lundy wants to surrender then he should be taken away from being the governor. So Lundy accepts this uh, and he leaves the governorship and he is not the governor anymore. So the governorship is going to be up for debate but the defence of the city is then handed over to Baker, Colonel Baker and to Reverend George Walker who they become later the joint governors. But they're in charge of the city defences and they start forming new regiments and they uh, basically the, 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 whole, the people are, are not happy with what's going on but now they know that Lundy's out of the way. These new regiments can be formed. So there's there's eight regiments are formed, and uh, seven foot, and one of horse. And the seven foot were Crofton, Hamill, Walker, 
Parker, Mitchellburn, Whitney and Baker. And the one of horse was Adam Murray's horse. So Watson was made the master of the artillery and he was a, an old soldier who had fought in many campaigns before. And he had 200 gunners and then they resighted the guns and they brought the big guns up including Rora Meg and her sisters as they were called, the, the big heavy poundage guns. The Jacobite force at the city was around 10 cavalry regiments and 25 regiments of foot. Round about 10,000 strong, led by Hamilton. Although the Irish regiments were very ill-equipped. In one regiment, it's reported that there was only 7 muskets for 800 men. So that tells you the story. Their artillery at that time, at the start, consisted of 8 cannon. And these were two 18 pounders, which sounds a lot. Um, if we look at this, this is a this is a six pounder cannonball, so 18 pounder would be bigger than that again. But when you're going up against thick, heavy walls, it doesn't really do very much. Even this here just bounces off and bounces back again. So, um, but they had two mortars, and mortars the shell would be about. 32 pound shells, a big, big round shell, like a, bigger than a football, more like a basketball, even bigger again actually. Uh, if you remember in school the old medicine balls, and these things were heavy, but inside them there was shrapnel, bits of metal inside them with powder, and these things, they were flown up high over the walls, uh, and then they exploded, and they, they destroyed anything in their path, and they were deadly, absolutely deadly. So there was two of these mortars at the start. But this still couldn't be seen as a siege cannon. Um, it's not really a cannon that's going to bring about a breach in a wall, which is really what sieges were about, making holes in walls. So the Jacobite commander, uh, Hamilton, sent a letter to the city asking for its surrender. No chance. That wasn't going to happen. So by the 18th of April, at 10 o'clock in the morning, James himself arrives with the Count de Rosen, the famous man from that we talked about last week who led the, the sallies over the um, fords, the Battle of the Fords. And they decided to take all their men, two regiments of men, including the king's own guards, and their colours and bands, and march up to the city and ask for its surrender. Um... Haha, -ha. this is this is this is basically when James and all his rebel band came up the Bishop's Gate. So this is exactly what we're talking about. So they rode up the Bishop's Gate and they were greeted with a cannonade from the city and muskets and the cry of no surrender. We all know that cry very well now, friends, but this this was the first time to be heard in Ulster. No surrender. There would not be a surrender. So James was dismayed by this. He, he could not believe it. And not only that, but he was losing men. Some of his own men. A, a guy called Captain Troy, who was one of his friends, was killed within feet of James. So James retired back and he, he, he was just dumbfounded by this. He sat the whole day on his horse and watched the city while the city fired cannons down towards his men but they were the men were away from the city and it was really just defiance they were showing their defiance towards the Jacobites but James sat all day and then he sent more and more messages into the city uh, for the surrender and it was not going to happen no surrender is what they replied back every time so James was uh, furious at this and he decided then that he was going to um, leave the scene and he left the scene with um, De Rosen and they accompanied him themselves, they accompanied him, De Rosen and a man called Melfort, General Melfort, they accompanied James back to Dublin. James left in, char in the, the, comp the charge of the, the, the siege back in the hands of Hamilton and the Duke of Berwick, his illegitimate son. He was put in charge of the blockade to stop any uh, supplies coming in and out of the city. 
Strong's Resort Orchard who, uh, was basically then chosen to be the Jacobites artillery. So James, as soon as he left, he also put in uh, uh, provisos in that the, the Jacobite main artillery would be sent to the city. So this eight guns would be backed up with more and more artillery as the days went on. So on the 23rd of April, the Jacobites camp capture quite an important place and that's Colmore Fort on the foil. And this is important because this was held by Williamites from Ballymena, funny enough, uh, a guy called it there. But the Jacobites captured the fort without much resistance, to be honest. Adair retires back. Um, but this also gives them charge of the foil. It means that they're in charge of both sides of the foil now. So um, the Williamites are in a great position. Um, because now the relief that was going to come up the foil can be stopped in a certain respect. But Adam Murray, he's in the city rallying all these people and getting these people together. And on the 23rd of April, the Jacobites lead an attack towards the city through the Pennyburn Brook, which is a small river in, in Pennyburn, just, just north of the city. And... Um, they, they were led by Colonel John Hamilton's Irish foot. And Murray saw this movement and he asked for uh, permission to attack them. So Murray um, got his troop of horse together and also another troop of horse led by a man called Nathaniel Bow. And they went towards Pennyburn. But Murray had also sent out 500 musketeers from the garrison to get into the hedgerows. To basically hide themselves in the hedgerows. And to flank the Jacobites as much as they can. As soon as they come up to Windmill Hill. Or sorry, to Pen Pennyburn Hill. Um, the Hamilton then, he sees that he's in trouble. This is John Hamilton, the, 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 the colonel of the Irish foot. He sends back to Monmont, who is in charge of the Jacobite garrison by this time. And Maumont, the French commander, he wants to send cavalry and dragoons to help um, to stop the Williamites because he can see three miles away is this where this battle's going on at, at Pennyburn Mill, Pennyburn Hill, and the Williamites seem to be in, in command. The, the 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 troop of horse are are, are taking charge. Hamilton is stuck basically in sort of hovels around the, the area. So um, he looks around. Unfortunately, he has sent most of the cavalry out to find forage, to find food and to find clean water and stuff. So um, there is only 400 um, dragoons and 40 cavalry left. So Monmont takes half of the dragoons and he takes 40 of, his, of, them, of the French cavalry and he then leads them himself up along with the Duke of Berwick to attack the um, Williamites. But Murray is, is doing a great job uh, because the Jacobites are coming and they're, they're pushing, they're pushing and then they're getting into this, this area where the musketeers are, the hedgerow. Murray then sends a, a message back to the city to send more musketeers to stand on the hill. So 500 more musketeers come down from the city and stand on the hill and now they're firing down. They've got the trajectory to fire down the hill. So Murray's in a good position now except he sees this relief force coming. So he decides to attack the Jacobite cavalry that's coming to relieve the, the musketeers. And in the immediate time, the musketeers on the hill are starting to take a toll upon um, the Jacobite infantry in, in and around the hobbles. So the Murray then gets into a position that he, he has to try and retreat back. Um, he, he's gone too far forward and, and he's, he's literally surrounded by Jacobites. And... It's hand-to-hand -hand combat between his men and the Jacobite cavalry. Um, and it looks like they're going to lose. But then you have the men in the, the hedgerows. And they start taking out Jacobite cavalry. And the Duke of Berwick leads a charge up towards Murray. 
and the the Duke of Berwick and Mon and Monmont lead this charge, and Monmont is killed. Now, some people say that it was a hand to hand combat situation between him and Murray, and Murray actually was injured three or four times, but still fought and killed Monmont. Now, there's no hundred percent um, record of this. There was so many records all over the area of the time, Walkers, Mackenzie, so many more. But uh, this whole thing about Murray killing Montmont, we don't know, but he was killed. Montmont is killed. The Jacobite commander in charge, put in charge of the garrison by James, is killed. Uh, and this is a massive blow to the Jacobite hopes. Um, the Duke of Berwick does his best, and he is a very, very good commander, a very good commander of, of cavalry. He proves himself later in the Marlborough period in Queen Anne's Wars, how good he is um, as, a, as a cavalry officer. So he is one of the better Jacobite commanders. Tries his best, but he gets so far forward, and then the city guns, the city cannon, start firing down upon him. And he gets caught, and then he has to go back through Pennyburn again. And he's under the fire of the, the musketeers from the hill and the musketeers from the hedgerows. And he basically he, he suffered very, very badly in casualties. And he has, it says that, that all the men who, who did the charge that day, who survived, they were wounded. And there wasn't one that wasn't wounded. And also all their horses were wounded. So the Jacobite cavalry is decimated in a certain respect, by the attack at, at Pennyburn. So Murray himself is injured a few times, um, and he is taken back to the city. He's looked after the doctors in the city, and, 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 and he recuperates. Um, Walker then uh, takes charge, basically. The Jacobites try again, there's a small Williamite force at a place called Windmill Hill. And, they, and it's just outside the city as well. And the Jacobites try and force the Williamites out of this. Walker and, and Baker themselves see this happening. And they decide that they're going to do something about it. So they get the regiments together from the city. And they decide that they're going to take on the, um, the Jacobites at Windmill Hill. And this is this is a bit, you know, there's a lot of conjecture about this, but uh, Walker and, and Baker, they do a great job and they kill around about 3, 000, or 300 Jacobites. Now, Walker always, if you read Walker's account of the siege, you're always going to hear Walker's account on it and it, it's very biased about how great he was. Um, and then Mackenzie and other people are writing about it. But Walker... Um, they, they do a great job, and they only lose a very, very small amount of men. Um, so they lose they lose three men and 20 wounded. The Jacobites lose 300, including commanders. And not only that, they lose five flags. Now, f flags are very important at this time because it, it they were the, the sign of the authority of the king. So the Jacobite regiments who are sent to take Windmill Hill, they're beaten back by the Williamites. Uh, and basically, they lose these five flags, and it, it it's a massive, massive blow to the Jacobites because they're losing officers. Maumont, Ramsay is another one that they lose at Windmill Hill. So um, the Williamites are are in such a great position now; they're winning, but the problem is the Jacobites are now ready to start the bombardment. And two days after the attack at Pennyburn Hill, two great mortars have arrived from Dublin. And they are set up in Strong's Orchard. Along with a Denny Culver, which is a 32-pounder, this is a big cannon. And they start firing into the city. And the first casualty is an old lady who is killed in the city. Um, on the 24th of April. On the next night, on the 25th of April, 17 people were slew by a bomb. Probably a mortar, we believe. Wouldn't have been a cannonball, would have been a mortar. So the Williamites 
are, are basically trying their best. They've won at Pennyburn Hill. They've won at Windmill Hill. Very important. The Jacobites are demoralised. But now the Jacobites are starting to bombard the city. And people are dying. And the morale of the people is starting to go. But the only thing that they have to hold on to is that the rest of their garrison, Enniskillen is holding. Enniskillen are doing their best. Sligo um, and Ballyshannon are, have, have, have held. They've lost a lot of people, but they're holding. But even if they don't hold, they still have Enniskillen, uh, and then they can retreat the men back to the city. So they have so much going for them. Um, Basically, and the, the biggest thing of all is they know that William cares and William is sending a relief force. He's already tried to send a relief force that was sent away by Lundy. And this is the sort of end of Lundy. Lundy is, is now looked upon as this Judas, this guy who leaves the city. Um, some people say he dressed up as a woman. We don't really know about this, but we know he leaves the city and goes. He doesn't see himself as part of the defence force. He doesn't see himself as someone who um, wants to resist James because James, in his eyes, is the lawful king. So the Williamites now, um, with Adam Murray, with Baker, with Walker, with Mitchelburn, are in a position that they're going to just have to hold. They're going to have to hold the city. They're going to start running out of many, many things. And this is a good bit when Murray comes in as well, because Murray is going out. Um, Murray takes a couple of weeks, and then he, he's back at it again. And then he goes out in the darkness, goes out outside the city, and, and takes what we call sallies. So he goes into the Jacobite line, steals food, steals guns, steals uh, whatever they need, gunpowder, whatever. He starts to really hurt the Jacobites. Uh, and the, the legend of Murray is just growing and growing and growing. And he, you know, the guy just proves that he is he's a reliable person that the people of the city can look to. So Murray is, is, is going to be pivotal in, in this whole uh, situation of defending the city. Uh, and also keeping morale up. You know, he has rallied the people. They're all wearing these white armbands, white handkerchiefs, you know. Um, and... Well, this is, this is from Mackenzie's uh, play. Murray, of all, he did excel. Before him, the numbers fell. He tempered steel, he boldly drew. With which the brave moment he slew. And forced the rest of Jacobites to cry, Mon bleu, mon bleu. <laughs> um, so, a mon jeu. So um, yeah, so basically, the Jacobites are are bombarding the city. The city has nowhere to go. They just have to wait for this relief force to come. But now people are starting to die. Now the the Jacobites are are starting to really take its toll. And in the next talk, we'll talk about how the Williamites continue on to fight because they do. Because they don't give up. Even though the Jacobites have a sword at their throat. And they're bombarding the city. And they're starting to starve people. The people will hold until relieved. So that's the end of, of Londonderry. Enniskillen we talked about are holding. They're doing their bit too. Enniskillen's doing a great job. The rest of the garrison. Sligo, Billy Shannon. Are doing their great job too. So the Donegal guys are doing their bit. London Derry guys are doing their bit. The Enniskillers are doing their bit. What are the Scots doing? The Scots are virtually finished. And this is the whole thing. The, the, the Williamite uh, defeat of the Jacobites at Dunkeld. I mean, there was 300 Jacobites killed at Dunkeld. It wasn't an awful lot of men. But it was a real kick in the teeth. Because the Jacobites believed that a force of 4-1 to one could defeat the Williamites. But they didn't know about the Covenanters. And the Covenanters... We're not going to be defeated. Um, so the Jacobites didn't get the support from Ireland that they were writing all about and they wanted. James had, in a certain way, had lied to them. Um, they weren't going to get the relief that, that, that they were told that they were going to get. 
Um, winter is coming slowly. You know, this is April, May, June, July. So we're in the August. You're in the September. So the, the, the Williamites have pushed the Jacobites out. The Athol men around the area have all succumbed and they're now supporters of William. So the the clans who were at Kelly Cranky have all been pushed back to where they come from. And the Campbells are doing a great job in marshalling the rest of, of our guys here. So Mackay's in a great position. He has so many men to garrison the different towns, Fort William and being one of the famous ones. He, he he's doing his he's doing his utmost to try and keep peace within the, the place. The only Jacobite that's causing any tr real problem is a young Rob Roy McGregor, who is going into the Williamite lines and and stealing food and stealing things. And he's trying to rally the, 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 the McGregor clan and trying to get them going as well. So he's the only real Jacobite that's still causing trouble, but the Williamites are, are in such a great position. Hugh Mackay has done a great job after Killy Cranky, the disaster of Killy Cranky. He's done a great job. And now the Jacobites are being forced back and forced back and forced back. And they really don't do very much. The, the, the winter comes, the, the, the two forces don't do very much. Um, it, it really will not come until 1690 and then you have the, the cross, Hawes of Crumdale. I was going to talk about the Hawes of Crumdale today, but I'm going to leave it for another couple of weeks. And we'll probably do it just around the same time as the Battle of the Boyne because it's not far off, you know. So the Jacobites in Scotland are nearly finished. Uh, until they get support from James, until they get a relief force from France, they're not going to be able to do very much. The clans are, are demoralised and they're, de they're defeated. Um, the Macleans, all of them, they've, they've all went back to where they come from. So the Williamites are controlling... The lowlands, of course, and the highlands of Scotland, and the main cities. So the Jacobites have really not much to do. And really that's it when it comes to Scotland. Uh, we will talk about the Halls of Cromdale and the Battle of Cromdale in, in a couple of weeks' time. But, my friends, this is really the end of, of today's talk. Um... Anybody who's any interest or anybody any particular things they want me to cover, you know, I've I've covered literally six months of history there in less than half an hour. That, that that's a lot to do because I mean the book that I take most of the stuff on for the Siege of London Dairy is this one McCrory's book. Um, it's one of the better books, and also uh, Thomas Witherow's London Dairy and In a Skillin, a great book, but. You know, you see how thick those books are, and they're they're covering the same amount of history that I'm covering half an hour. I'm skipping through a lot of stuff, and I don't want to annoy anybody by skipping through a lot of stuff. But um, there's a lot of stuff in these books that it's conjecture; it's not you know actual history. I'm keeping to the facts of the of the, of the campaign. Um, and as I say, really in Scotland now, there's not going to be much more. So Ireland's going to be the main focus of the next couple of talks um, next week. We will be doing the rest of the Siege of Londonderry. Then we will do the Battle of Newton Butler, uh, which is a big, important battle. Then we will do the relief coming from England. Um, and then that will be basically that the, the, the end of the siege, the relief of the city. And then we will have Schomburg and his um, invasion, basically, to take back the take back Ireland for, for William.